Hi, we continue today in Luke 3, starting in verse 15, after John the Baptist has responded to the triple question, what should we do, in response to his own warning, you brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the wrath to come. And today we begin with a uniquely Lucan section that will merge into pieces from Mark and pieces from so-called Q, the parts common to Luke and Matthew that aren't in Mark. Um, after Luke inserts his, his unique piece here, as the people were filled with expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John whether he might be the Messiah. So let's begin today by looking at the chart on the right side of the screen where you can see in blue uh, the part that was in Mark that Luke and Matthew are both uh, working from, then the parts in bold in the center that are unique to Luke and the parts that in the right side um, that are bold that are also uh, unique to Matthew and the parts that are red are the parts that are common to Luke and Matthew. Um, so uh, if you can't, if that's too fast to follow here, you can obviously always hit pause or you can download it from the website where I'll post this chart. Um, so a couple things to note, we've been, as we've been following here, we can see that uh, clearly Mark started off with the common uh, issue of John being the messenger sent in the wilderness, but only Luke had this description of the time uh, in his section that you see at the beginning there in the 15th year of the reign of Emperor Tiberius. Uh, and then as we move into our section here, we see that Luke in this black uh, bolded section here has inserted this uh, between the part that starts here and the part that continues here that Matthew has in a, in a direct sequence. So Matthew does not have the what should we do and the three uh, kinds of economic justice that uh, Luke express, has Jesus expressed there. He simply has John give this long continuous speech. Um, a similar thing to note too is that in Luke uh, all of these words from John and both the part unique to Luke and the part that here that uh, Luke displaces down to here from the part common here, putting part of it above and part of it below his own insertion, is that Luke's Jesus, or Luke's John rather, is addressing this to the crowds that came out to be baptized, whereas Matthew's uh, has it addressed to the Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, which is an odd thing at all that Sadducees would come for baptism, but we'll take that up when we get to Matthew's gospel eventually. But I want to draw that attention here to highlight that despite the fact that they have this common source and they use the almost identical language by shifting who the audience is and the narrative context, it changes the message. Um, so as, or as Mark is doing this against the people who become Jesus' opponents throughout, uh, John is doing it against the very people who are supposed to be disciples um, and preparing them for authentic discipleship, not just membership in a society that will, membership alone will save them. Hence, the not children of Abraham uh, is sufficient. Um, so that's the place where we, we have it here. And also the fact that John's response uh, here in Luke is uh, uh, it's a response. In fact, John's words here, I'm sorry, is a response. Whereas in Matthew, it's not a response. He's just continuously talking as part of uh, what he's saying to the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming for baptism. But here, um, Luke has John answering uh, all the people who are filled with expectation and whether John's the Messiah. So this is a message to the people who are hoping and wondering if the Messiah is coming, as opposed to here, the people who uh, will be Jesus' opponents throughout. Um, finally, as you can see, Luke adds the piece about Herod uh, shutting up John in prison here that Mark uh, displaces way till later, till chapter 6. And Matthew doesn't have it all here. Matthew has Jesus' baptism by John following. Of course, another factor that is unique apart from this immediate context is in Luke, we see that John and Jesus are related um, by blood, if you will, because uh, their mothers, Mary and Elizabeth, are, are kinspeople, whereas there's no Elizabeth in Matthew's, Matthew's gospel, and so we don't see that relationship. But of course, in Luke, we don't see a discussion between Jesus and John at the baptism, as we'll see in chapter 4 of Luke. So that's a bit of the narrative context that we're looking at here. So um, going back to the text where we start here, um, as the people were filled with expectation. And you can see the word for expectation, prostodontas, here is used a number of times. And it's plainly here an expectation rooted in this context. It's really important for uh, people who identify as Christian readers here who have been shaped by an expectation of heaven and hell or some kind of afterlife to be reminded constantly uh, that Luke's Jesus is about a very this 
worldly uh, expectation, specifically the expectation of a Messiah who will rid the land of the Romans and of Roman oppression. And we'll see that played out uh, throughout the entire story. But Luke has made it explicit by starting this section, as we saw here, um, with the description of who the leaders were. And we'll also see it today in terms of Herod. So the expectation is, uh, framed around a Messiah, that God would send someone who would lead an army or would be a prophet like Moses or perhaps a priest like Aaron or perhaps some combination like the folks at Qumran at the Dead Sea believed that there would be um, a, a, a Messiah like David who would be uh, a warrior leader who would rid the land of the Romans and then a Messiah like Aaron who would purify the temple, uh, much like the temple was purified after uh, the, the Maccabees victory over the Seleucids in the feast that becomes Hanukkah, uh, the celebration of the purification, the rededication of the temple, the very meaning of the word Hanukkah. So a number of expectations and Luke doesn't pin that down here, simply the question of the Messiah, uh, but it's important for us as readers to recognize that Messiah could be one of a number of possibilities uh, or a combination of more than one. And so all are questioning in their heart, which is uh, a Semitic phrase, as Marshall notes for us, dialogue is omenon, panton, and tais cardias, the dialogue in the heart. Uh, dialogue in modern English seems like a positive thing that we encourage people to engage in dialogue as opposed to hate speech or attacking speech. Uh, but as we'll see, the verb here is often used for people who are trying to figure things out rather than receive the word from God or, and or from Jesus. Um, so um, it, it establishes a stance less than pure your faith, but one where people are trying to figure out what's going on here. And we've already seen it in 2.19 and 51. You can go back and see those examples you want, if you want. And what they're wondering is, in with their expect, expectancy of whether John might be the Messiah. And we'll see that that question, whether John was the Messiah or Jesus the Messiah, continues later in Luke. For example, we see this quote um, in chapter 7, after Jesus has been out healing and exercising demons and has just raised uh, the widow of Nain's son from the dead, and we hear this. The disciples of John reported all these things to him, which is to say in prison. So John summoned two of his disciples and sent them to the Lord to ask, are you the one who is to come or do we wait for another? So even in chapter 7 from prison, John isn't sure if Jesus is the Messiah, um, and he's not even disclaiming whether he's the Messiah, but he does that right away here in verse 16, as we'll see uh, in just a moment. And so that passage continues, when the men had come to him, which is to say to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you to ask, are you the one who is to come, or are we to wait for another? And Jesus will respond by naming the things he's done and uh, express that sense of answering the question by the works he's done. Um, but uh, the, the issue here, whether who might be the Messiah, is not one that has ended uh, in this immediate moment. Uh, and it continues really historically after the lifetime of John and Jesus. So we get to verse 16 here, John's answer. Um, and now, as my note below says, up to now, John Baptist's message was consistent with standard Jewish prophecy, but now he's a witness to Jesus. Okay, so John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water. And baptism, as we've already seen briefly, but I'll uh, mention it here. Uh, as, my note, as my note says, only the narrator has mentioned baptism before, um, the baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. But now it's named as a baptism of water. And the verb baptizo simply means to dip in water. And as you can see from this picture of a mikvah um, in uh, the town of Magdala, uh, and there are mik mikvahs like this all over the place, um, it would be routine to have a, a water basin that people lowered, or a water pit, not really a basin, that one would lower uh, one in self into by stairs and then be purified from various uh, violations of the Torah and other things. But it was not the sense of what later Christian baptism is as signing up for a commitment to the way of Jesus. Um, and even then, it's not about, quote, being a Christian. It's simply about accepting Jesus program for how Yahweh is going to uh, save the world from the Romans and redeem the people. Um, so we'll see that more when we get to Jesus very soon. So John says, I baptize you with water, but one is more powerful than I am, literally a stronger, the stronger one. And as you can see uh, later in Luke, I'll bring up the, the verse here from 1121. Uh, he uses that image, Jesus uses that image in a little parable. He tells, when a strong man fully armed guards his castle, his property is safe, but one stronger than uh, he attacks him and overpowers him. He takes away his armor in which he trusted and divides his plunder. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. So uh, what we see named here uh, will be played out later. There's going to be a, a, 
a conflict between power sources, between who is more strong. And Jesus representing God, of course, and the empire representing the evil one or the devil, as we'll see much later. So one is more powerful than John who is coming. And then he says uh, in a phrase that we see uh, here in all the gospel, all the synoptic gospels, but if you look closely, we, uh, we can see some differences. I'll show you in a moment. I'm not worried to untie the thong of his sandal. Note in Mark, it says, I'm not worried to stoop down. And so um, Luke omits the stooping down. Similarly, in, Ma in Matthew, it's I'm not worried to carry his sandals. Um, so all of those would be mean considered menial labor here. Uh, the word for worthy, hikonos, or sufficient, is used a number of times in Luke, as you can see there. There are different words for, for honor, and in that sense of the honor-shame code, but here it's sufficient. So the one who is stronger, this one, John, is not sufficient to untie the thong of his sandal. And uh, here, untie meaning to loosen, and as Marshall notes, only non-Jewish slaves were required to perform this menial duty for their masters. Um, so he's positioning himself as less than even uh, the lowest of the low in the social hierarchy within Israel there as not even worthy of doing a job that a non-Jewish slave would do. Um, and instead, he says, the one coming will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And scholars and readers have long struggled over that. Is that two things? One baptism in the Holy Spirit and a separate baptism in fire? Or is Holy Spirit and fire and diadis, as literary people describe it, two words connected with an and that are implying one concept, which we see regularly here? Um, some of the possible Old Testament background here is um, from uh, the prophet Joel. Uh, and there are many examples of that, of fire as and cleansing or burning. Let's look at this one from Isaiah 4 uh, that I have noted there so you can see just simply one example of it. Whoever is left in Zion and remains in Jerusalem will be called holy, everyone who has been recorded for life in Jerusalem. Once the Lord has washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and cleansed the bloodstains of Jerusalem from its midst by a spirit of judgment and by a spirit of burning. So that combined image fits very well with what we'll see much later in, in Luke's Gospel, where Jesus will uh, lament Jerusalem's failure to recognize the time of his visitation by God, and will warn Jesus' followers to get out of the way of the rubble that will be caused, caused by the Roman army in its destruction of Jerusalem. So whoever is left in the land after that destruction, of course Isaiah 4 is not referring to the, the uh, Roman situation many centuries later, but certainly Luke is, if not imagining this exact text, certainly uh, echoing various texts like this throughout the prophets of um, a fire as a spirit of both purification, uh, pur burning off impurities, and also a spirit of God's judgment on, in the sense of the last day. And we'll see that many times here. Fire in Luke's gospel uh, is a number of times here, and we're going to look at another one in a minute because in the next verse uh, we're going to see fire again. So one way to read this is that the fire is the baptism uh, of the Holy Spirit we see in Acts 2-3, the so-called Pentecost story there, where tongues as a fire come down. But another aspect is that people be baptized with the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, but the baptism of fire is the baptism of judgment, in which, um, as we'll see in the next image, the wheat are separated from the chaff. Of course, wheat are not separated from the chaff by fire, but a lot of different metaphors overlapping here, and um, we can only partially keep them separate. Uh, I'm sure they're really not meant to be kept separate. Ultimately, they're meant to blend together to get the attention of the audience and a, and a point of crisis uh, in, in the Greek cr crisis for a point of decision. Um, so he continues here, uh, and again, an image that we see common to uh, Matthew and, and Luke, but not in John. Uh, his winnowing fork is in his hand. Here you can see a, a reproduction of a winnowing fork in the ancient world, uh, wooden often, and because they're wooden, they wouldn't be preserved very easily from the ancient world. Um, but the winnowing fork would uh, lift up uh, the, the large quantities of wheat in the air and, and then sift it, and so the chaff would be separated it on a threshing floor. And here's an image of a threshing floor. I wanted you to see this. You can see it's not like a floor in a barn or something. It's a space and almost always on a hillside so that when when the wheat is threshed, the chaff will be blown away in the wind. And we'll see in a moment a number of images of that from the prophets of, of the evil or the people who reject God as like chaff blowing away in the wind. So this image of a winnowing fork to clear the threshing floor and to gather the wheat into the granary. And we might picture a barn or granaries here from the word apotheken. Um, but uh, we can note from this image here, this is a more common way, certainly for the Israelites and many people in that time, to have um, pit granaries, if you will, um, to store the grain in 
the ground rather than an above ground, um, which would mean it's not vulnerable to rain and wind, etc. A uh, pit like this would be covered with rocks and other things uh, to keep things safe. You know, much like we'd have a wine cellar uh, to store wine, you wouldn't put that up in the attic probably because it would be hotter. So it would be very common uh, to store a grain in these underground stone pits. Um, so that's the fullness of the image here um, of the winnowing fork clearing the threshing floor, uh, gathering the wheat into the granary. But plainly, it's an image of separation and of judgment. Um, the image of chaff here, we can hear just a couple of examples. It's several times in the Psalms, starting in Psalm 1, which you can hear right here. The wicked are not so, which is saying not like the good, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Uh, here's another one from Isaiah 29. Both the multitude of your foes shall be like small dust, and the multitude of tyrants like flying chaff. Um, so uh, that common image from the prophets being brought forward here. Notice how Luke does this intertextually, sometimes uh, explicitly quoting, like we see quote, you know, from the book of the prophet Isaiah, and we'll see that again in chapter 4, and sometimes uh, just with background images that either the audience gets or doesn't, depending on their cultural education in the biblical world and the Jewish world. Um, but certainly it's easier for us to see that when we have the tools that we have to, to look up words in the way that they couldn't in the ancient world. And finally, the image ends with burn with unquenchable, unquenchable fire here, puri asbesto. And so uh, the common element we know is bestos, which is obviously dangerous because it's carcinogenic, uh, carcinogenic uh, these days, uh, meant a fire you couldn't put out. Um, and that's also in Matthew and in Mark, um, but it'll be played out in Luke in a way uh, that uh, isn't in the others. So you can see this image from the story of the rich man and Lazarus, where they end up um, in, the rich man uh, ends up in, uh, in Hades, and he has this expression of speech to Father Abraham. He called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus to tip the dip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in agony in these flames. And similarly from First Enoch, we can see this image. Because these waters of judgment minister to the healing of the body of the kings and the lust of their body, therefore they will not see and will not believe that those waters will change and become a fire which burns forever. Whether in the first Enoch image, and uh, as we've seen already, and we'll see many times, first Enoch is a common um, back text for Luke that he draws upon many times, a uh, common apocalyptic text in the ancient world. Before there was a Bible that put Enoch outside the Bible, it was as quoted a text as we'll see Daniel was in terms of apocalyptic imagery. But both of these images are of a fire that we, I want to note for Christian readers. This is not hell in the way it's been taught through centuries of Christian you know, platonic disembodiedness of the place a soul goes, because really once one thinks about it, a soul, a disembodied soul can't be hurt by fire, can't be burned. It's only a body that can be burned by fire. So whether the image in the parable of the rich man in the flames or the chaff burned in unquenchable fire is not an image of being souls being sent to hell, but the standard apocalyptic sense of God destroying uh, those who are in the way or who reject God's way. Um, so the reign of God can be made manifest on earth as it is in heaven as we'll see later. So let's scroll down just a little bit so we can see the rest of our passage for today. So with many other exhortations here, um, parakalon, which can mean both comfort and exhortation. Notice it's not far from what in John's Gospel is the paraclete, um, described as the comforter or the defense attorney, as I like to call it here, um, in the noun form of the verb parakaleo, to call or to comfort. So he's trying to encourage them here. Another way to put it would be to, to encourage them. The good news to the people. And it's not the first time we've seen good news, as you can see from my note before. We saw it in 119 and 2. 10. Um, but in this context, as we're moving from John into the ministry of Jesus, I'd like to bring up a couple of passages from Isaiah that certainly must be in Luke's mind, if not here, uh, elsewhere. Because as you can see in my note down below, good news is used a number of times in Luke, and the verb euangelizo is 26 times in the Gospels and Acts, and 25 of those are in Luke-Acts. Uh, none in Mark, uh, none in John, and only once in Matthew. And so it's a very popular word for Luke, and because it's so many times, I'm, I'm not going to post those all for you. But I want you to hear uh, what that would mean. Um, good news in that sense in the, in the Hebrew Bible, uh, whether in the Hebrew language of it or here in the Septuagint using the Greek euangelizo, um, would mean um, something that God is doing to liberate the people. In the wider Greek context, it would often mean uh, a new king, the king is dead, and good news, there's a new king. Or it could also mean in the Rome, particular Roman context, good news, the empire is providing some benefits for your province or for your town, and so you should be grateful. But 
plainly, as we hear from these passages from Luke, it has a different meaning in the context of Hebrew scripture. So let's listen to this one from Isaiah 40 at the beginning of so-called second Isaiah, calling people in the exile to re take the journey back to restore and uh, rebuild Jerusalem. Get you up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good tidings. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift it up and do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. See, the Lord God comes with might, and his arm rules for him. His reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms and carry them in his bosom and gently lead the mother sheep. So here we hear the good news of God is that God is coming and will care for his people. That's the good news there to Jerusalem and the cities of Judah. Similarly, a dozen chapters later in Isaiah, we hear this. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of the messenger who announces peace, who brings good news, who announces salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. And of course, that will play out uh, all the way through Luke 21 and beyond, where Jesus will say the kingdom of God is near, um, as Jerusalem, ironically, will be destroyed. By, by the Romans in the time after Jesus. Um, so that sense of good news of God coming to Jerusalem to try to redeem God's people is one that will echo all the way through the entire gospel. Um, and so far this has been good news, but it's not good news in these last couple of verses, and that's where we need to go to finish this here. Um, and noting here, again from my chart that I've had up, um, this is unique to Luke to put these here, and it really juxtaposes this, the theme that we're going to see all along, is that before the good news can be manifest, there also has to be confrontation with empire, which is not going to be happy with this threat to its own power and the transformation that it implies. So let's look at 19 and 20, and then I'll uh, provide a few resources to help us hear this more closely. But Herod the ruler, who had been rebuked by him because of Herodias, his brother's wife, and because of all the evil things that Herod had done, added to them all by shutting up John in prison. So first of all, we have to situate this a little bit. I showed you uh, this chart when we started chapter 3, and we first looked at the question of the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius, etc. So you can download it from an earlier page uh, in, the, in the episode starting at the beginning of, of Luke 3. But here I just want to bring it forward so we can hear what's going on here. So the Herod the ruler here is Herod... Uh, Antipas, uh, and that's this one. This is the time period we're talking about in Jesus' lifetime. And this story about uh, the wife is found in Josephus, so it's not something unique to the Gospels. Um, Josephus records it here in Antiquities of the Jews in chapter 18, section 5, and I've highlighted a few pieces there so you can see his version of it. Josephus' version is a little different. Um, he's saying here that the army of Herod was defeated, and as you can see at the bottom, some of the Jews thought that the destruction of Herod's army came from God, and that very just is a punishment of what he did against John that was called the Baptist for Herod slew him who was a good man and commanded the Jews to exercise virtue, virtue both as to righteousness toward another and piety uh, etc. Um, and so in other words um, this argument between uh, Herod and other um, his family members and others um, resulted in a loss of Herod's army and Josephus understands that some Jews think that the murder of John was, you know, vengeance after the fact, whereas Luke presents it as it's because he rebuked him for his unlawful marriage. It's hard to know which is, quote, true, which really happened, but it's important that Luke uh, shows uh, John as uh, expecting the ruler to follow Torah, to follow Hebrew scripture. And we'll see that all the way to the very end of Acts when well, Paul will appeal to the local king, the successors to Herod, and um, expect him to also follow God and be faithful to God despite the power he has. So that theme will go all the way from Luke 3 all the way to the end of Acts. Um, the word for rebuke here uh, is, is the only time here in Luke Acts. It's the more common word is epitomio, which is like literally means to dishonor. Um, and uh, there are other words for that. Uh, so this is only here and one time in Matthew, an unusual word. Um, and notice that, that Luke's um, narrator here does not specify other things that Herod does, but just simply summarizes all the evil uh, using the word panera, uh, which is used all those times you can see in Luke. And then finally, adding them all by shutting him up in prison. And um, the word for prison here, thulake, um, can literally mean guarding or a guard post. So it can be used for a range of references, as you can see there. But plainly, uh, this means putting him in some kind of imprisonment. And I want to note a couple things about that. Um, so here's a quote from a modern scholar um, on his book, Penal Practice and Penal Policy in Ancient Rome. And I won't read it, but I will post it on the website. But I want to note a couple things from the center there. Prison was deliberately a place of terror designed to strip the prisoner
prisoner of all dignity and to induce confessions by both physical and psychological means. Um, and he notes also that prisons, unlike in the modern world, were not places that people are sentenced to to spend time there. They were holding places either to get people to confess or to have them await their execution. And the only way that people ate was if family members brought food to them. And as you can see in the quote, uh, bribes were prevalent and conditions were terrible. Um, this picture of a prison uh, in the Roman world um, it shows you some of the terrible conditions. They're almost all underground in the dark. And as you can see um, from this chart, uh, Luke will make a point of showing how uh, the disciples end up in prison. First, Luke, uh, as Jesus, will, will tell people that. Um, as you can see there in chapter 12 and in 21, where people who are listening to Jesus will be put in prison. Um, in the first case, it's part of a parable. But in the second one, it's for discipleship. Um, Peter in 20, chapter 22 promises he's ready to go to prison, but he's not yet. He will be later. But we see in Acts when the apostles and others end up in prison. So um, we see in chapter 5, um, the apostles are put in prison. And then we see Saul on the side of that before he shifts. And then in chapter 12, um, after Herod had seized Peter and put him in prison, um, and then Paul and Silas are put in prison, and then Paul recalls that he's been put, put in prison. So many times throughout Luke and Acts, we hear this question of being put in prison um, as an expectation that you'll be killed as a cost of discipleship. And so uh, that's where Luke leaves it before he moves into new territory and into the baptism of Jesus and to the genealogy of expressing where Jesus came from. And that's where we'll turn next time. See you then. Bye-bye.